appealing for witnesses after the body of a woman was found dead in woodland on the outskirts of Leeds. This whole area was closed off. This whole area here, it was frenzied. It was incredibly violent. She was stabbed at least six times, one of which has gone through the windpipe. They were determined that she was going to die. The most horrific murder in cold blood of a young, defenceless mother of four children. She's gone. And they're still, they can still ring their families. On the outskirts of Leeds lies the parish of Potter Newton, close enough to the hubbub of the city centre, yet a stone's throw from the family-friendly suburb of Chapel Allerton. There's a real mix of people, a real mix of housing. It's the kind of place where you probably give your neighbours a wave, have a quick chat with them, and it is the kind of place where anyone would want to live. It was sort of an up-and-coming area. There's boutique-type shops and younger, new, demographic of people. The mix of city centre life and village atmosphere was a draw for 26-year-old Sinead Wooding. Sinead had four children. She had two children with one partner who she separated from at an early age. And then she went on to have two more children with her husband, Akshar Ali. It was important to Sinead to have a place she could call home. She had had a fairly unsettled childhood. At the age of four, she moved to live with her dad and half-sister, Natalie. She was so dainty, so tiny. Um, I remember when she came home, she was four, and she's just looking at me. She was just so tiny with these big brown eyes. She was a sweet, fun-loving little girl. When Sinead got a bit older, she was quite feisty. Um, she used to get me into trouble a lot, all the time. Everything was always my fault. It was just normal, normal sibling rivalry and normal sibling love. She drove me insane sometimes and would argue, but I would never, ever let anybody else hurt her, ever. I adored her. In her mid-teens, Sinead left the family home for a short time, then moved in with sister Natalie where her strong, independent personality shone through. She was a wild child. She didn't listen to the rules. She didn't want to listen to my rules of having to come in at a certain time and keep her room tidy and do chores. She didn't want any of that, so she ended up moving back out. When Sinead was 17, she moved to London, met a man and went on to have two children. But when the relationship broke down, she moved back up north and started trying to make a life for herself. I know that she did, she did do a bricklaying course, which quite fitting really at that particular point because she was still very tomboyish. Sinead from a very early age was a bit of a tomboy. She loved football. She also did have a good work ethic. She did a bricklaying and plastering course. She also worked in a garage as a mechanic and I think the latest career she pursued was um, hairdressing, which she trained in. As part of her bid to make a better life for herself and her children, Sinead made a big decision. She had converted to the Muslim faith. There was a suggestion that the main reason she converted was because she wanted to get away from the alcohol. She wanted to use that as a means to, to stop drinking for the sake of the children who she absolutely doted on. So we, we had loads of conversations about it, and I, kept, I asked her why. She just said that it's just what she wanted. She couldn't give you a full explanation of her why. She just said that she prefers to live that way. There was a period of time in her life when she was wearing Islamic dress, living what one might call a, an Islamic uh, lifestyle. And it was while living her new life that Sinead met her new man. Sinead enjoyed a whirlwind romance with Akshar. They met in 2014 and married within six months, um, going on to have two children. Akshar was a doting husband, a doting father, and they seemed to have the perfect marriage. Akshar was about a year older than Sinead, so 27, that he'd been working 
on some sort of a market store selling fast food. She'd met him by chance. Um, they'd become close and had gone through um, some sort of an Islamic um, wedding. And friends started to notice how this new lifestyle and the security it brought her and her children suited Sinead. She adored her children. She brought happiness to the room when she walked in. She seemed to be happy. She said that he, he was good, he was good with the kids. Um, he provided for her, he supported her. Um, she didn't want for anything. Life with four young children was hectic, but Sinead and Akshar still managed to find time for themselves. She loved to, to have a drink and, and a dance and singing and, yeah, she liked all about it. And on the 11th of May, 2017, the couple were invited out to a party at the home of a friend, Yasmin Ahmed, a few miles away. Sinead, Akshar and the children all went into the house. The atmosphere was very nice. But just a few hours later, the atmosphere at the party changed. Guests at the party heard Akshar and Sinead arguing in the kitchen. And then Akshar told guests that she'd gone home. With Sinead having stormed out of the party, Akshar is left to round up the children and take them home. But Sinead was not there. In fact, Sinead didn't come home over the weekend, leaving her concerned husband no choice but to report her missing. Akshar Ali said he didn't know where she was, that she made a habit of just disappearing, that had an argument, and that he was worried about her as well. He'd been trying to text her to find out where she was, that the kids were worried about her. Concern for Sinead's well-being grows among her husband, sister Katie, and children. Where had she gone to after leaving the party? And why had she not been in contact? On the outskirts of Leeds, Sinead's other sister, Katie, rallies around a concerned Akshar Ali after he reveals he's not seen wife Sinead for three days since she stormed out of a party at friend Yasmin Ahmed's house. And he said that they'd fallen out, that Sinead had got drunk, and that she stormed out of the house and he hadn't seen her since. Having reported Sinead missing to the police, they need to look into her background. Did she often disappear? Who might she have met? Was she hiding any secrets? Sinead has been reported missing, and the first thing the police will do is a kind of a victimology. So they will look at Sinead's history. Is she the type of person we would expect to go missing? Was she unpredictable? And there was a record, if you like, of Sinead having problems with alcohol and being unpredictable. A missing person investigation is launched, but immediately, Everything changes. A body has been discovered in woods near Orwoodley Crags by a group of runners. The badly burned body is yet to be identified. The body of a woman had been found at a place called Orwoodley Crags. In the morning, she had been set alight. The body was found by joggers. That body had been wrapped up in a duvet trussed up with wire, doused in petrol and zetalite, where it was found by the joggers. The body had been badly burnt and, in fact, was still smouldering. Immediately, police launch a murder investigation. The initial response of the police, of course, would be to cordon the area off. They know a woman has been murdered, and the job is not just to find out who she was, but how she died. <laughs> this whole area was closed off. This whole area here, all the car park was closed off. Um, there was tape everywhere. It was all cordoned off. And then eventually, they got out all of the bracken and all the undergrowth, and it was all pulled into the car park, I suspect, to be um, checked through. News of the murder soon spreads. Chapalatan, you don't expect anything like that to happen there. It's, it's really middle class. Like, you know, you don't expect people's houses to get broken into, never mind, to have a murder down the road from that area. It's bizarre. 
it was a very shocking crime at the time, not something that happens around here. So I think a lot of people were obviously very worried that somebody in, in the community could do something like that. Killing somebody in that way, burning a body. People were very, very concerned that somebody out there or, or, who could come in here or come to any shop in Chapel Allerton. Yeah, very worrying, really. Police cordon off the crime scene and the body is taken for a post-mortem to identify the victim and establish a cause of death. Fortunately for the police, although most of the body was burnt and damaged, the left thumbprint was um, not damaged by charring or burning and they took a print from that and were able to identify the body of the unknown individual as that of Sinead Wooding. My dad phoned and said that um, Sinead had died. Um, I tried to get the information out of my dad of what, how, when the liaison officers came around to see me, um, they sat me down and said that Jeanette had been murdered. Um, they couldn't tell you a whole lot at that particular point because obviously it's an investigation. They just said that she'd been found and where she'd been found. By some some joggers in the early morning. It was difficult. Very difficult. What would be going through the investigators' minds is why was Sinead murdered? They won't have known how she was murdered. What they will know is that for some reason her body was bound by wire, wrapped in a duvet and set alight. That's actually quite unusual in the UK. And there could be all sorts of reasons. To hide the wounds, to burn any trace evidence of the murderers. It might have been to hide the fact that she was who she was, to completely hide her identity, who knows? The first thing that you need to do as a pathologist is to initially assess that body look at the degree of damage, look at what evidence may still be available, and then, as quickly as is practical, to move on to answering the question, has this person died because of the fire, or is this fire an attempt to destroy a body or conceal evidence? Initial examinations of Sinead's body give police a crucial piece of information. Sinead hadn't been murdered where her body had been found. It was quite clear from what the post-mortem examination found that she had to have been killed elsewhere and then taken there by somebody. So where had Sinead been killed and how? Police desperately need to know where Sinead disappeared to after leaving the party. As the examination of that body goes on, the injuries, the stab wounds will begin to reveal themselves. There is six stab wounds, one of which has gone through the windpipe, and we have head injuries in keeping with the use of a claw hammer. Given the absence of defensive type injuries to the hands and arms, the story here is an assault to the head, followed by a stabbing when the person is unable to get that knife away from the assailant. It's the logical sequence that would follow from the injuries present. It hits you like a ton of bricks, and it, it kind of feels like everything around you is in slow motion. Everything seems to slow down, and you can't seem to function. With police having established Sinead was murdered elsewhere and her body then wrapped up, moved and dumped in the woods before being set alight, 
they are left with many unanswered questions. Who killed her? Where was she killed? Where is the murder weapon? While officers at the scene search for clues, detectives start to look at Sinead's last known whereabouts. The party she and her husband, Akshar, attended at friend Yasmin Ahmed's house on 11th May, three days earlier. Straight away, the police would want to be knowing exactly what happened in that house, who had been present. Sinead, Akshar, and the children all went into the house. Everything's going very well. Uh, everybody's getting on. Then Akshar and Sinead started drinking. They were the only ones who were drinking alcohol. And it's clear both of them drank to excess, probably Sinead more so than Akshar. And there was then an argument. He then leaving the kitchen area, coming into the living space and saying, I want everybody um, to get the children ready. We're going back home. Sinead left the house via the back door. So the party at Yasmin's house dissipated and ended, and the children were all taken back home by Akshar. But when Akshar returned home, Sinead was not there. He had been trying to text her to find out where she was, that the kids were worried about her, all this sort of thing. Police need to establish where Sinead went to after leaving the party. But then a discovery is made at the woods, close to where Sinead's body was found. The police found a piece of paper, a petrol receipt. They were able to identify the petrol station where the car had filled up. They got the CCTV, identified the car. Police discover CCTV footage of the car being driven through the streets of Potter Newton late on Saturday, 13th of May. Could this be the car which transported Sinead's trussed up body to the woods before being set alight? Police seize the car for forensic examination. Is there sign of Sinead having been inside? And any clues as to who was driving? It was the on-call biologist for the northeast of England that day. A call came in it was about examination of a vehicle. We went out to look at a Volkswagen Golf and um, that was believed to have been used to transport Sinead Wooding's body to the deposition site. The blood staining that was found in the vehicle was sampled and then it was submitted to the laboratory. When it was in the lab, we actually sent it for DNA analysis and we got a full DNA profile from that blood staining. The DNA profile matched that of Sinead Wooding. The owners of the car are questioned, but have an alibi for the night of Sinead's disappearance. However, they admit to police that on the night of Saturday, 13th of May, they had lent the car to a friend. Asim Ali, the brother of Akshar. Police have arrested a 27-year-old man on suspicion of the murder of Sinead Wooding. The police liaison officers informed me that they'd arrested Akshar Ali. In the quiet suburb of Potter Newton on the outskirts of Leeds, police investigating the murder of Sinead Wooding have discovered a vehicle which they believe was used to move Sinead's body. It showed that a small amount of blood from her was present on the boot seal of the car, and therefore, one explanation, if she had indeed been concealed in wrappings and then placed in the boot of the vehicle, is that only a small amount of blood had been transferred onto the boot seal. Having discovered the car was lent to Akshar Ali's brother, Asim, the night before Sinead's body was found, both men are arrested, sending shockwaves through the community. Yeah, it's really shocking that there was a murderer working at the market. You just don't think that that kind of thing can happen around you. You, you see it on the news and it's removed from you. It's not part of your world. And the next thing, you, you know, they're nearby. Police may believe they have the right people in custody, but still have no idea as to where Sinead was murdered and why.
So investigators are always conscious that they need to establish the motive for someone's murder. Detectives start to delve into Sinead's marriage to Akshar. They found out that the relationship between Sinead and Akshar Ali was not a good one all the time. She really tried to kind of present this perfect relationship, perfect family. There was some suggestion that they'd agreed at some point that they would spend some time apart. She'd also started wearing Western clothes again, something that to him would have signified a loss of control over her, something that he just couldn't tolerate. Sinead had converted to Islam in a bid to take control of her life and give up alcohol. But police discover that as her relationship deteriorated, she started drinking heavily and confided in friends she wanted to leave. We now know that Akta Ali was a very, very controlling individual. She wasn't even allowed to see her friends. She was discouraged from seeing her own family. So to a large extent, she was a very isolated individual. She'd been thinking about leaving him. She'd been hesitant to do that, largely because of the children who she doted upon. She's got this record of having a problem with alcohol, of being maybe a bit unpredictable and maybe a bit violent. Now, with that record, if her husband was to make any kind of complaint, she may lose her children, and I think she was very frightened about that. He would have used the children as a means by which he could just keep control of her. Police believe they have their man, but still have no idea where Sinead was killed. They trace back to her last known movements. On 10th of May, 2017, Sinead made a call to West Yorkshire Police. She said that her husband was making malicious calls and sending malicious texts to her. They spoke to her on the telephone in the early hours of the following morning when she was able to assure them that she was fit and well and that the children were safe. The next day, Sinead went house hunting with a friend. On her return, Akshar said they were going to a party at Yasmin's house. She, Akshar, and the four children then made their way to Yasmin's. It was the last time anyone was to see Sinead. He said that they'd fallen out, that Sinead had got drunk, and that she stormed out of the house and he hadn't seen her since. Police had verified the arguments. Guests at the party heard Akshar and Sinead arguing. And then somebody said, look, if you're going to argue, go into the kitchen. So now Akshar and Sinead could only be heard behind the kitchen door, going at it, no doubt, hammer and tongs. And there'd been a loud bang heard, which had caused Yasmin to go into the kitchen to see what was going on. She came back out again a few minutes later, saying, oh, it's just uh, Sinead, she's drunk, she's bumped into something, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, and the party carried on. Akshar maintained that following the argument at the party, Sinead vanished. But now police start to ask, did Sinead really leave the party? Having identified Akshar Ali, the police spoke to Yasmin and it became clear that the two people who had last seen Sinead before she died were Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed, and that the location at which they'd been was Yasmin Ahmed's home. And so the police then targeted Yasmin's home as being the most likely location at which Sinead had been murdered. Two days after the discovery of Sinead's body in Woodland, crime scene investigators swarm Yasmin's house. The fact that some people who had been at the party were saying that they did hear a loud bang and that they didn't see Sinead after that. The police very, very quickly decided, we're going to get into that house and we're going to search it and search it thoroughly. But what they discover is disappointing. The initial police and forensic examination found no trace of Sinead having been attacked in the kitchen. There was no blood or anything like that. But 
But then police discover something which alters the whole course of the investigation. The entrance to the cellar was only discovered through the tenacity of the police search team because it won't have been obvious that it was there. When they looked into the cellar, they saw an immediate drop onto a concrete or stone floor of about eight foot. So they would be thinking then, if Sinead had been put in there, she's had a serious fall and will have been injured in there um, and kept in there for quite a period of time. We had been informed that a blood dog had been into the cellar along with the crime scene investigators and that they, they had identified what they believed to be blood staining. In particular, a large area of blood staining on the middle of the cellar floor. We were asked to go out to determine whether or not Sinead Wooding had been assaulted within the cellar. Forensic investigators carry out intense searches of the cellar. You could see that there was a large blood stain in the middle of the cellar floor. It was dark brown. It looked like it had been wiped or cleaned in some way. But certainly, it gave us a positive reaction in a test for blood. And in my opinion, somebody had really been laid there for a period of time whilst injured and bleeding. As we were looking at this blood staining, it became evident that there had been some attempts to clean the walls as well. Certainly, there was a wall black paint at the bottom and cream paint at the top. The cream paint looked very clean compared to other surfaces. And there was some scoring in the paint as well, which suggests it might have been cleaned with a scourer. Once we got our bearings in the cellar, we could actually see that blood had been distributed on the walls, in particular around the foot of the ladder. It was characteristic of impact spatter. There were clear blood spatter patterns and that in itself tells you there have been impacts into wet blood. The size of the droplets will be telling you how hard that impact is likely to be. The direction that they've flown will tell you something about whether somebody was moving or stationary. We tested blood staining from that area and the blood staining was found to match that of Sinead Wooding. So my assessment of what happened in that kitchen is that Sinead was attacked in there, probably after an argument, and bundled into the cellar, where she fell to the floor some eight foot below onto a hard surface. I think she was alive, and I think she was then murdered sometime afterwards in cold blood. We know she was stabbed at least six times. We know she was hit on the head at least twice, presumably using a claw hammer and a knife. Police now believe Sinead was killed in the cellar. Her body left there for two days before being wrapped in a duvet, dumped in woodland and set alight. The cellar was then cleaned in a bid to remove all evidence of a murder. Police believe Akshar could not have carried out the crime alone and arrest Yasmin Ahmed. Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed were subjected to interviews over the following two or three days. Neither of them admitted their part in killing Sinead. They said they had no idea uh, what had happened. By this stage, the police knew that a concerted effort had been made to clean up the crime scene. Who did that? Police also arrested a woman by the name of Vicky Briggs, who actually lived with Yasmin Ahmed. Police now have five people in custody. Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed on suspicion of murdering Sinead Wooding, plus Yasmin's housemate Vicky Briggs, Ali's brother Asim, and one other on suspicion of assisting an offender. But why would Yasmin Ahmed kill her own friend, Sinead? Police soon discover that while Akshar's relationship with his wife was breaking down, he was growing closer to mum of three, Yasmin. They became really close friends, and there was this issue as to whether they were involved in a, a relationship. Sinead was unhappy that Akshar, when he was going home from work, used to go and see Yasmin first, he used to spend a lot of time at her house. And that did lead to some conflict between Akshar and Sinead, because Sinead was, um, let's say, jealous um, that there was something going on between them. 
a sexual relationship. Were Akshar and Yasmin having an affair? Had they wanted Sinead out of the way? As both are charged with murder, the question remains. Who dealt the fatal blows? November 2017. The trial into the murder of Sinead Wooding opens. I did attend the trial. Um, I think I attended every day for the first week, two weeks. And then I couldn't keep going anymore. It was so hard. Five people take to the dock. Sinead's husband and father of two of her children, Akshar Ali, and his friend, Yasmin Ahmed, plus her housemate, Vicky Briggs, Asim Ali, and one other, all accused of assisting an offender. The Sinead Wooding case is noteworthy not only for the level of violence that's inflicted on her, blows to the head with a claw hammer, stab wounds, but then the very calculated way that her body was dealt with. Left in a cellar for a period of time, wrapped up, removed, and then the attempt to set fire to her to destroy the evidence. Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed plead not guilty to murder. At no time did anyone admit their involvement in the murder. Akshar Ali, Yasmin Ahmed maintained their innocence throughout the trial. We, we were defending Yasmin, so our job was to present her case the best way that we could. Initially, her case had been that she didn't know that anything untoward had happened. And, and really, Akshar Ali, Yasmin Ahmed, just blamed one another throughout. The prosecution needs to prove that both Ali and Ahmed had killed Sinead and dumped her body in a bid to get away with murder. The court hears that despite keeping up appearances, the relationship between Sinead and Akhtar was marred with alcohol-fueled arguments and violence. Sinead's family was shocked by some of the details about their relationship that came out in court. And I think the fact that she didn't confide in them and they didn't know stuff that they would have wanted to help with, perhaps that's meant that, that he had successfully isolated her. I never, never knew anything was wrong between Sinead and Akshar. She never mentioned it, never gave me any inclination that there was anything wrong. Um, if she had done, I would have helped her. Um, I wish she had done. Having had a difficult childhood, moving between homes, Sinead was desperate to give her children the kind of stability she'd never experienced. By adopting an Islamic lifestyle and marrying Akshar, Sinead was seeking that security. But it was clear that her marriage was unravelling and Ali's control over her was growing. Akshar had CCTV cameras trained on the house. One of the neighbours gave evidence that whenever Sinead left the house, Akshar would just turn up and stop her from going out. The month before Sinead was killed, Sinead and her kids spent the weekend at Sinead's sister, Katie's. Sinead actually said to Katie, I don't want to go home. Um, at the time, Katie thought that that was because they'd had such a good weekend together, but she now looks back and wonders if there was more to it and perhaps if she'd pursued that line a bit more, maybe she could have found out what was actually going on, and she finds that really hard to live with. The court hears the couple often argued when Sinead had been drinking, and Akshar ascertains that she would often disappear, as he claimed she had done on the night of her death. But this is disputed. There's no doubt that there were times when Sinead would leave and go and visit either her sister or one or other of her friends, but she never went without the children. If she went somewhere, she always took them with them. And remember, her children were all very young, all below 10. It seems Sinead's devotion to her children became the ultimate downfall. She wanted to leave Akshar, but there was one thing he held over her. One of the things that was 
troubling Sinead was Akshar having said that he intended to take, I think, one of the children, possibly the youngest, to Pakistan. On the night of the party, things came to a head and the couple argued. Controlling people think they own their families, their partners and their children, and they center their own needs completely. So you can imagine Akshar thinking, how dare this woman, who I actually don't want anymore, it's not like he wanted to keep her in the relationship. She was getting in between him and his sons. He'd probably been planning it for quite a long time. He just maybe was looking for an opportunity to put that plan into operation. Sinead was plied with alcohol before she was thrown in a cellar. She was later beaten and stabbed. And then when she was dead, her body was wrapped in a duvet, trussed with wire, thrown in a car boot, and then it was dumped in a car park in some woodland, and her body was doused in petrol and set alight. Despite speculation surrounding the couple's relationship, Akshar pleads his innocence and has a theory as to who killed the mother of his children. Akshar's story that he and Sinead had the argument that the other people in the house had overheard, and she had just stormed off. And that was the last he saw of her. He said the only logical explanation for Sinead's body having been at some point in the basement of Yasmin's house was that at some point, Sinead must have come back to Yasmin's house. And it must have been Yasmin who murdered her. Aksha Ali believed there was no scientific evidence linking him to the killing, and the killing happened in Yasmin's house. Realizing she was now in the frame, Yasmin changes her story. Her case was she played no part in the actual murder itself, that she had become involved in cleaning up a cellar. After all, it was her house and she would be a prime suspect if there wasn't a cleanup. And if the body remained there, she would be the prime suspect in the killing. So she had a motive to get rid of the body. But the prosecution's case remains that both Yasmin and Ali were involved. Sinead did confide in people that she was being assaulted. She did tell people that she was unhappy, and she did, she did articulate to some extent that this was domestic abuse. Sinead was definitely a victim of domestic abuse at the hands of Akshar Ali. There was a controlling bully. There's no doubt in my mind that he coerced and controlled Sinead for most of the time that they were together. He would have used the children as a means by which he could just keep control of her. And I think the motive for the murder was that ultimately she had had enough and decided that she was going to leave him. The jury sees CCTV footage from the night of the 13th of May, 2017, which caught Yasmin and Akshar walking along a road near her house. They then borrowed a car from an acquaintance and moved Sinead's body from Yasmin's house to Old Woodley Crags and set it alight. That footage, along with the evidence at Yasmin's house, is damning. The jury saw through that and quite rightly convicted them both of a most horrific murder of a young, defenseless mother of four children. Domestic abuse is a choice, and Akshar Ali chose to be an abusive, controlling partner to Sinead until he lost control. And then, in cold blood, he decided to kill her. Akshar's brother, Asim, plus the other defendant, are cleared of helping to assist an offender. But Akshar, Yasmin and Vicky are all found guilty. Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed were both sentenced to life in prison with a recommendation that they serve at least 22 years before they become eligible for parole. Vicky Briggs received four years imprisonment 
for helping cover up the murder. Sinead's family are in court to see her killers face justice. She's gone. And they're still... They can still ring their families. And speak to their families and say, I love you. Or I miss you. Sinead don't get to do that anymore. So I just think, no matter how much time they got, it would never be enough for what they've done. But in the bigger picture, that's a long time. And it's nothing more than they deserve. The thing that struck me after meeting this family and speaking to them about their loved one was just how broken they are after this. And you do wonder whether they will be able to, to move forward with their lives. Losing Sinead has given them a life sentence, and I don't know if it's something they'll be able to come back from. That's very upsetting to speak to a lovely family who have lost someone through no fault of their own. And they live forever with the knowledge that they never really knew what was going on in Sinead's life. When I found out about it, the guilt that wasn't there, when she needed me. That I wasn't there to protect her. And I should have been because I'm a big sister. And for Sister Katie, Sinead is always in her thoughts. Always playing with the butterflies, always trying to hide. My beautiful little sister was always by my side. I will always have our memories. I could never say goodbye. Not now, not then, not ever. Forever asking the question why. I will always have our memories. No one will ever see. The moon, the light, the sky at night. No one can take them away from me. I will always love you, Shady. And when I feel that breeze, I will look up to the sky at night. I will always have our memories. <laughs>